Um, so I call this presentation that I whipped up for you guys, how to make freelancing work for you. And that's really kind of what I think that we're all really needing to do as journalists. Um, there are, as Dan alluded to, a million different ways to freelance. Uh, there's so many different projects, so many different focuses um, that you can take. And one thing about freelancing is there are going to be things in your background, in your location that make you uniquely and perfectly suited to do certain things. And if you're doing that as a freelancer, that's a really good opportunity for you to carve out a niche for yourself. So a little bit about me. Um, I am somebody who's actually made a lot of pivots in my career. I started as a nighttime police reporter for the San Antonio Express News, um, which at the time had a fully separated website and newspaper. I was hired to work for the newspaper. I made it a point to um, seek out experiences to write for the web, to do some live blogging and things like that. Um, because at some point I knew I wanted to make a pivot. While I was at the Express News, I pivoted beats. Um, and then when I left, I went on to different jobs at uh, Dow Jones. Um, then I did grad school and I started working in audience strategy. I was at Digital First Media, Yahoo Finance, Business Insider, and Bloomberg. Um, now I'm at Mina Media. And if you look through my career, it's essentially been a series of pivots. Police reporter to business reporter, from business journalist to doing audience strategy, um, from audience strategy to travel writer. And now with COVID-19, having put travel um, you know, on indefinite delays, I'm now working more as a business writer and an audience strategy person. I've also pivoted from full-time to freelance, from local news to national news. Now I'm working with local news clients again. And I think that this is something that not just myself, but all of us as journalists are uniquely suited to do. Because essentially our job is to go in, become a quick expert on our new area, on our new market, on our new beat, and to figure out how to distill this news and information to other people. That flexibility, that ability to change, that ability to figure it out comes in super handy when you're a freelancer. So as a freelancer during the pandemic, it has not been all roses. There have been days where I've seen projects wrap up and wondered, am I going to find something to replace this income? There have been clients that I've lost, um, clients that have cut budgets, clients that have restored budgets, new clients. I was actually surprised the first few weeks after everything started shutting down that I was able to gain a couple of new clients. Um, and really what I felt is a lot more empowered and a lot more secure than I had expected I would. At first I thought, oh man, um, things are starting to look bad. I kind of wish I had a full-time job and didn't have to pay for my own health insurance. Then I started to see my friends get laid off, lots and lots of them. The ones that didn't get laid off were getting to do more work for less pay. They were getting furloughed. They were having their pay cut. Meanwhile, um, while I lost clients, I added clients. So Overall, I stayed pretty steady in my income levels and um, didn't have to deal with some of that uncertainty my colleagues had because at the time um, COVID-19 really hit, I'd say I had around 15 clients and while I lost a few, I gained a few and I turned out to be in a pretty decent spot. Um, I think I finally come to terms with the fact that the chances of all of my clients laying me off on one day are um, very slim, particularly considering that I've got a diversified operation as a freelancer here. Um, that said, it took a big pivot. A lot of last year was spent as a travel writer, writing mostly for travel and leisure and for um, Departures Magazine. I got to do some great stories. Um, but, you know, come March, it was clear that there was going to be no travel happening. All my travel assignments were canceled, had that little bit of a freak out, and then started to think, what else can I do? Um, so I reached back into the things that I had done before, business writing and audience strategy work. And I really went after finding more of those kinds of projects. And I have pivoted. I actually just helped launch a um, new tech business publication called Rest of World yesterday. I've also been working a little bit with the Economic Club of New York. Um, and it's great because I'm not doing PR for them. I'm basically live tweeting some really cool events that I would have covered as an economic journalist. Um, but I'm just not doing it for a news source. I'm doing it for the club. Every single time I've done one of these live tweets, 
I have absolutely learned so much and really enjoyed it. So while the subject matter has changed, it's still something that's giving me a lot of joy and tapping into kind of different areas of myself that I hadn't tapped into last year. Last year, I spent most of my time on the road. So really digging in and coming up with a comprehensive audience strategy for a new publication, um, coming up with launch plans, all of that wasn't something that I was really able to fit in in airport layovers and things like that. So if you're just getting started as a freelancer, if you're coming back into it um, after some time away, this is actually probably my second iteration at freelancing. So, you know, there's definitely lots of opportunity to learn. When you're getting started, I would say suggest you ask yourself three guiding questions because this can really be the foundation of your freelance business. As a freelancer, you're an entrepreneur. So you really need to think of yourself as a business and think about what services can you offer that no one else can offer? What value can you provide? Another thing that's really great as a freelancer is you can also think about what you want to do next. I mean, the thing about starting out and the thing about pivoting is getting that first chance when you don't have any experience can be so absolutely hard. By freelancing, you can get different kinds of experience, fill in those gaps, and make a stronger argument for those opportunities you might be looking for, especially if you're trying to pivot. So I would suggest everyone think about what is it you know? What is it you, you really have an expertise on? For me, I love travel. Anybody who's known me knows that this period of eight weeks at home is about to just drive me crazy because I haven't not used my suitcase this long in years. Um, so I know that I know travel, but that's not all I know. I used to cover economics and the Federal Reserve. Um, I covered the bank bailout. And now as we're uh, take, talking about government aid for coronavirus, that knowledge is uniquely useful and gives me an opportunity to market myself. I've recently started writing um, economic explainers for coin desks, largely because I covered um, all these economic institutions in the past. So that was something that I know from my past that I'm able to use to create opportunities in my present. You know, we have a question uh, just from the audience, just to jump in. Uh, Vicki asks, so when you talk about audience strategy, um, what do you mean by that? Uh, so that's really social media strategy and audience development strategy, also a little bit of SEO, newsletters, basically. I kind of describe it as I'm your modern day paper boy. I figure out how to get your audiences where they are and how to get um, our content in their hands through other forms than paper. Great. Thanks. Sure. Um, okay, another thing you wanna think about is who do you know? The reason I got some of those amazing assignments last year um, were because I knew certain editors having worked with them in the past. I had long used my personal travels as an opportunity to generate freelance travel stories so that I could do more travel writing. And guess what? It worked. So reaching out to editors and saying, hey, you know, there's been a restructuring at my company or I'm freelancing now for whatever reason can really be helpful because then they know that you're looking and it's easier for them to give you these opportunities. Another thing to keep in mind is journalism is an incredibly volatile profession. If you haven't been laid off yet, you will be laid off. So if you tend to reach out to other editors and you say, hey, I've been laid off, there's been a restructuring, there's been something, they generally want to help you because someone in that position helped them at a time when they need it. And almost everyone I know is really willing to pay that forward. If they can find a budget for you or help you out in some way, they tend to want to do that, which is great because journalists are generally a really good bunch. Um, another thing to think about is what you want to do next. When I was in graduate school, I actually went to Northwestern and got a unique degree in media strategy and leadership. It's basically how to build audiences with a lot of business classes and a couple of other classes that I was interested in thrown in there. Right before graduate school, I had been a wire service reporter covering all the economic indicators, Fed and economic policy out of Washington, D.C. for Dow Jones Newswires and the Wall Street Journal. Now, for any of you guys who know anything about a newswire, you know that the cardinal sin is to give a piece of information out to a reader before they've gotten it from their newswire service. Because that's why people are paying so much money for these particular tools. Um, the Bloomberg Terminal, for example, sells for like 30000 a year because they want uh, they want to be a source of news first because that's where they derive that value from. Um, so at the time, reporting for online, experimenting with digital journalism, social media 
were not okay. So I hadn't done any of that in my career. I found some freelance opportunities through Global Post and other sources to actually start to incorporate more of that social work into my portfolio. And that really helped me get future jobs and make the broader pivot that I had with my career. So just to clarify uh, as a question, so you were doing some of that freelance work while you were working full time, you know, was that right? No. Kind of really for me, freelancing earlier in my career was something to do between jobs. Got it. So in graduate school, I was full time in school, but I also wanted to gain experience. So I freelanced then, um, worked at the Thunderdome, we shut down, had layoffs and had freelanced just in between jobs. But almost every full time job that I've had had a pretty strict freelance clause. And there's only like one or two times that I'd ever been able to find a way to work around those. And so like you you get laid off on a Friday or something like, mm -hmm. like what is your, what's like the first thing you do from a freelance perspective? Is it email? Is it tweeting it out? What's your approach? Um, I think the first thing is really to kind of just come to terms with it and then start to let your communities know you don't necessarily have to tweet it out. I might start with a message to my closest Slack group. I think the biggest thing is you want to take some time, a couple days, think about what you want to do next and then tell people what you're looking for and that you're on the market. This is basically their chance to grab you. Um, for potential projects. Everybody's got way more work in media than they have time to do it. This is your way of saying, hey, I'm an extra pair of hands. Would you like to work with me? So I think really, you know, being okay with it is the first step because when you tweet it out, when you put it out on LinkedIn, there's going to be incoming questions. So you want to be in a place to confidently, you know, speak to those questions and explain what happened in a way that you're comfortable with doing it in public. All right. Do we have other questions? Just feel free, folks, to just drop those into the chat um, at the bottom of the screen and uh, we can answer. But uh, for now, let's let's go ahead. All right. So as you're putting together this freelance business, you've um, there's a few things that you're going to absolutely have to have that you never had to have in your journalism career before. A system for invoicing, system for tracking and managing your projects. Um, a system for tracking your payments. Now, you're going to have to fight to get paid sometimes. Almost, I've only had like two clients who've tried to either negotiate lower rates or stiff me. And I'm lucky because in New York, the government has this lovely little form that you can fill out if someone takes more than 30 days to pay you. And um, I haven't actually had to fill it out yet. Normally, if you tell someone, hey, look, I'm going to file a complaint with the city, they'll go ahead and pay you what they legally owe you. That said, there are some clients that will take a long time to pay. Typically, you want to ask them, like, what's their payment schedule and um, go from there. I think the worst I've had is maybe like six or eight months. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, one way to get around that is if you've got a freelance contract with them, you can specify what your payment due dates are. But usually most editors will tell you the longest I've ever really seen is 60 days officially. That said, things get screwed up all the time. Um, so you're going to need to create that system for yourself. I use a just a simple Google spreadsheet. So I've got one column for the project I'm working on. I've got one column for the client because sometimes I'm working on multiple projects um, for a certain client. I've also got um, my fee for that particular opportunity. Is it a one-time fee or a monthly fee? My deadline um, and then my uh, payment status. So I've got a column of accounts receivable. I can go in and look at you know how much am I owed at any given time. And that's been the most helpful thing. I've gone a little crazy with it. I've color coded it. So my audience projects are one color, my writing projects are another. The key here is finding something that works for you to make sure that you are completing the projects that you are taking on, um, that you're invoicing for them in a timely manner because you're being late on your invoice is going to make them late on their payment and that you're tracking those payments coming in. So if something's fallen through the cracks, you can get to it in a more timely manner instead of being like me last year and having to chase people down at the end of the year because I still hadn't seen any money from them. So what you're saying, Mina, is like, you know, you don't necessarily, if I'm hearing you correctly, you don't need to necessarily have, you know, a 20 or 30 or $40 a month QuickBooks uh, online subscription. You just manage that all through this spreadsheet and I, I assume some PDFs and Word documents, that invoicing system. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a really simple system, but it works well for me. I can link to the work that's related. Um, I do my invoicing separately. I'm thinking about how I might do that going forward. But for now, for this year, this has been a very successful way of tracking things for me. We got a lot of questions coming in, so uh, yeah, I think you've hit a nerve here. All <laughs> I right, think everybody bring it wants on. to know. Uh, so, um, uh, one question from Susanna: um, You know, do you have a newsletter that a newsletter that you send out to uh, clients um, from time to time? Some freelancers I know, photographers yeah. I know will do this. Um, maybe like a quarterly update or anything like that. Any thoughts about newsletters? Um, newsletters can be really great. I haven't launched one yet. I've been thinking about doing one. I've kind of been at the what am I going to say that everyone else isn't saying stage. And also for the last few months, um, you know, going into March, I was insanely busy. So I didn't even have a chance to really think about how am I promoting my own business and myself. But newsletter is definitely something that's on my radar. I just got to figure out my cadence and what to say. Great, thanks. And then Alan asks, uh, my, my impression is that editors are overwhelmed with pitches since the lockdown and even sometimes getting acknowledgement of your pitches is really hard to do. What suggestions do you have? Is there a subject line or, um, you know, is it research ahead of time? Like, um, is it just leveraging your personal relationships? What, what is it to get acknowledged during this time? So I think one thing, the biggest thing is don't take it personal, right? Like it has taken me many months to go from when I send an email and expect an immediate response to send an email and let me go and do other things. Um, I think there's a few things that you want to do. First off, having those personal connections is really, really helpful. Go dig back into your past. I mean, like I'm like, I look. I love my people. I love my tribe. I keep in touch with people on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on WhatsApp. I'm in like 12 different Slack groups. Um, so I'm constantly in touch with a lot of people that I've come across throughout my career. Think about your former sources, your former colleagues, your former associates, um, anybody that you might be linked through through alumni networks or other networks, programs you may have participated in, interns you might have worked with, junior reporters you might have worked with. Really think about that full sphere of people you know and start to think about what kind of opportunities you could potentially find working with those people. Because you probably, as you go down, you'll say, wait, I didn't know this person was an editor at this place. I've been trying to get them to call me back forever. That can be really helpful. So start with just taking a survey of who you know. Um, and then the biggest thing that I found in terms of a pitch is keeping it super, super, super short. Like I think my most successful pitches have been maybe three paragraphs. Um, and whenever I've found, if I've had a pitch that's gone out and I haven't gotten a response, the biggest thing I'll do is adjust the subject line. Um, I think if you want to have, you got to write one of those subject lines that people just really, really want to click on. Um, I found one editor and I was like, look, I have a story that you absolutely have to read. And she's like, well, I'm not interested in that one, but what else do you have? Got an assignment that way. Um, I wrote one uh, pitch out and I didn't get a response. So I followed up and said, hey, this newsworthy thing has happened and this is really timely. Editor gets back to me and says, yes, I've been late on emailing you. I'd love to talk to you about that. So I think it's going to be subject lines and then doing a follow-up that's not annoying. Don't call the person ever. Never, ever, ever call the person. Um, send them an email. Give them at least a week to respond, maybe two weeks. Realize that they're just as swamped as you are. Think about whether there's a different way to sharpen your pitch, sharpen your angle. Um, you know, edit your pitch as you're sending it out. But um, I think there are going to be some people who just ghost you forever and some people who get back to you back to you. This is partly going to be a numbers game. Like I deal with a lot of rejection. That's part of the game. It doesn't matter who rejects me. All that matters is the people who actually get back to you. And if you try and you cast that net wide enough and you look at other touch points, maybe a publication that you're trying to get into that a former classmate of yours has worked at in the past, you'll start to uh, get some of those responses. Great. And yeah, I would, I would echo that just as somebody who does receive pitches, even though I'm, I'm sort of out of the daily game now, um, I do forward things on to editors at our publications at Media News Group. And I would just echo the, the briefness of it. The yep. shorter you can keep that, the better. Uh, I sometimes get pitches from PR folks and they're just like paragraphs and paragraphs long. And I, I just, I honestly just do not have time to read that. I think the goal should be, you know, 
you know, wet our, wet, wet the appetite enough to, you know, make the editor want to ask more. Like you've, you've given them just enough to be like, okay, there's something here. Like you're not, you don't need to pour your whole guts out, um, you know, yeah. in the email all at once. Um, great. Often like having that one quick succinct paragraph that is your story idea and that one paragraph about who you are, what your background is, essentially that this is why you need to hire me to write that story, two or three paragraphs and you can be ready to go. But spend your time on editing that subject line, make it one of those things where they're just, they're gonna to have to click on it. Uh, great, and um, another uh, question from Susanna, do you have a system for tracking and managing your pitches? Yeah, so everything is on the spreadsheet. So the second that I make a pitch, I add it to the spreadsheet. Um, I add my potential payment if I know that that's, um, if I have that information. And then I put the status of my pitch. So that way I know that I've pitched, like I, for a while I was trying to pitch um, a story about um, rooftop popping in Saigon. Well, I'm not going to pitch that now, but I had pitched it to travel and leisure and to departures. And I had that on my spreadsheet listed as this is the pitch. These are the publications I've made it to. These are the next publications that I'll talk to. Um, and then if a pitch isn't accepted, eventually I'll either take it to another publication or give up on it and turn it gray on my spreadsheet. Great. Um, so we've had a couple folks uh, asking about contracts, um, mm -hmm. which is uh, interesting. Um, I've got some experience on kind of working as a freelancer sometimes uh, where I do have a, a contract and other times where it's just, you know, the email is sort of the email conversation back and forth is sort of serving as the de facto contract. This is what the terms are. Sometimes receive it. How, do you have your own contract? Um, you know, how do you handle those things? So I don't have my own contract yet, um, but I think that's something that I'm going to change this year. So far, I've, I've been working under the contracts of my clients. Um, some clients, they're people, like I did a project with Experian, like they're going to have their own contract. It's going to be insanely detailed. They're only going to work under that contract. So that's something that I'll run into a lot. Same thing with like NBC, any kind of big publishers they're going to have your contract and it can, you can push back a little, but the bigger the company, the harder it is. There are a couple of smaller clients that I've worked with. Um, with many of them, they've come to me with their own contracts. I've had two or three lately that have not come to me with, con uh, with contracts, but these have been people that I've had some kind of connection to, like a friend of a friend of a friend or something. I can get to them in about four degrees of separation. They seem pretty legitimate. Um, we've got an email agreement of what the project is and what they're going to pay me, and that's worked out really well so far. That said, I've been really lucky. I'm counting my blessings. And um, the next part of my business evolution is talking to a lawyer so that I've got my own contracts um, in hand for anybody who doesn't have a contract. And I've got an idea of any asks that I might want to layer on to contracts that I'm not um, going to be able to have much sway over. Great. Um, well, I think that's all we have. Uh, that's all the questions we have for now. Um, so keep going. I, mean, I know we've got a lot of other things to cover. All right, so that's kind of gonna be your basic getting started on the business side. Um, a few other things you've gotta have, a Twitter account. Best way to get in touch with editors, especially editors who are ghosting you, is to engage with them on Twitter. Not in a creepy way, but like in a very natural way. Maybe you favor a tweet if they're making a call for pictures or something like that, and that will finally guilt them into responding to your email. Whatever it is, journalists are overactive on Twitter. So if you wanna connect with journalists, editors, and other content and creative types for work, you wanna be on Twitter. You wanna be an active participant um, and you wanna be there where they are. There's a conversation happening that could potentially bring cool projects your way. You wanna participate in it. You also want to have a LinkedIn page. I think nowadays, anytime I'm professionally doing anything with anyone, I'm Googling them and looking for a LinkedIn page. I want to know who they are professionally. As a freelancer, you're selling yourself. You're selling the perspective you've built over your career, and you're selling all of the things that you've proven that you can do over time. LinkedIn is a fantastic way to show people all of those things, not just tell them, but attach your work and really show them. You've also got an area where you can talk about 
your career narrative and focus that on freelancing. Um, so for me, I talk about how I am, you know, a person who's worn many journalistic hats, who has lots of different interests and finds a few different ways to channel those interests professionally. Think about what's your career narrative. Are you bringing 20 years of local news experience? Um, do you know this market like no one else? For that foreign publisher who's looking for, you know, a local story from somewhere in America, does anyone know it better than you? Not, that can be part of your career narrative and part of your pitch to sell yourself. Um, other thing you've got to have is health insurance. So I'm currently still on COBRA from a past job. Um, and I think that for me, what I did is I looked at all the sources out there for me and figured out that this is probably my best bet financially. De um, depending on your state, you're going to have different uh, healthcare marketplace options. There's also an organization called the Freelancers Union, which provides some health insurance options there. Everything that I found is in the like four to $700 range with a high deductible. So it's something that you're going to have to pay for. I pay about 800 bucks a month for my insurance. And at first I was like, you know what, this really sucks. I don't want to pay my insurance myself. And I think I look back on my career and I'm like, all right, I've had a few jobs where I've had my health insurance fully funded. Now I have to pay for it. I just have to think about that as I'm thinking about how much money I need to make every month to um, keep myself afloat. I'm just budgeting for that insurance. Um, that said, I've had a couple of freelance friends who were paying as little as like a few hundred bucks a month for their insurance um, if they're in certain states. But that's something that's very important, especially as a freelancer, because you don't get sick time either. And you certainly don't want to be sick and hit with giant medical bills that you could otherwise have some help paying for. Um, huge thing, don't forget to set aside money for taxes. I have an extra savings account um, that I basically just use for future taxes. So whenever I get a check, I try and put about a third of it away into this account. I don't even worry about deductions or anything like that because if I have to give myself a big bonus at the end of the year, that's not horrible either. Um, but I make sure I do that and I do that religiously because I don't ever want to get stuck in a place where I'm like, I have a huge tax bill due and my money's all gone. And that's the biggest thing to keep in mind is these, these paychecks. Um, I've had one freelance client who took out money for taxes, but almost all of them are not going to do that for you. So you've got to make sure that you're um, doing that for yourself. Can you uh, just sort of relate to that, Mina? Can you just talk about, um, do you make estimated payments? Um, like how do you, uh, how do you, I, I, I don't know whether you have your own, your business set up as an MS Corp, uh, an LLC, sole proprietorship, um, just as it relates to taxes. Sure. So right now I am a sole proprietorship and that's also something that I'm thinking about changing. I think for me that um, seemed like the easiest way to get started as I didn't really know what I wanted my structure to be. It was pretty simple. Um, so I've done that. And I think that now that my business has grown, I'm to the point where I might, um, I might actually change that. And yes, definitely um, having to do the estimated taxes. I think this year is a little bit weird because I haven't done anything yet with the COVID deadline extensions, but you'll definitely want to pay your taxes, um, estimated taxes quarterly, and then keep that money in your, to the side until those payments are due. Yeah, I would just say, uh, like you uh, started as a sole proprietorship um, with my business, which includes photography, writing, and some consulting work, uh, really similar to what you do, um, transition to a general partnership, and then a couple years ago, transition to an S-Corp and do payroll taxes uh, uh, quarterly. I can tell you that uh, I do not do payroll taxes. I pay somebody else uh, to do it, and it, it's good. Mm -hmm. So um, I can certainly uh, speak to the, um, you know, I think for those of you who are thinking about it, the S Corp certainly has a lot of advantages. Um, you know, it, it does require a little bit more work, um, pay quarterly payroll taxes mm -hmm. instead of estimated payments. Um, but especially with some of the changes in the tax law, and, and don't ask, I'm not a tax expert. Um, I can just say from personal experience, it's proved to be um, a, a good transition for us. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to invest in anything, the thing to invest in is going to be accounting services. Like, I am so not going to be doing my taxes in the future because I look at this year and I'm like, man, this year is going to be like a crazy mess of clients from all around the world. And I don't, it's getting more complicated. So I'll definitely bring in help for that. Um, I've known a few people have done the sole proprietorship because it's worked out well. I think in New York state, it can actually be really helpful, but that's another thing to keep in mind is your state's going to impact that as well. Um, so just, you know, 
that's one thing I think that's great about being a reporter is when you have a tax question, you've at least got the research skills to start to find an answer or enough to have a coherent conversation with an expert about it. And, and I would say one of the things, and, and I'll just speak to it since this is a largely a Colorado crowd, um, you know, mm -hmm. being based in the city of Denver is going to be, um, you're going to be taxed differently for services than, um, you know, if you're, say, in another city or you have a P.O. box in, uh, say, a different city. So just something to be thinking about. Um, you know, certain things like the city of Denver, for instance, and I'll just say from a photographic perspective, the city of Denver considers photographs that you deliver as a freelancer to be an actual good that you're delivering, even if you're not actually handing over film and, and, uh -huh. uh, and pictures. Um, the mere fact that you are giving a, a thing to them uh, means that it's a good and that um, you should be paying sales tax on it. Uh, the state of Colorado, though, for instance, does not look at photographs as a good, uh, but as a service. And so you don't pay sales tax on it. So um, just to back up what Mina said, like, I cannot overstate enough um, the value of having, um, you know, a good CPA, um, good tax person doing it. It's it you can sort of like at the end, like sort of feel like, goodness, I'm paying like a, a decent chunk of change for this, but I just the peace of mind as somebody who, you know, a few years ago was trying to do everything on my own and then transitioned, um, it, it, it really does make a difference. Yeah, it's also a tax deduction, right? So ultimately, yep. you're lowering the amount of taxes that you're paying. I also keep all of my deductible expenses in that same spreadsheet. So I have an idea of what are all of my current expenses that are linked to work that I'm doing. So, I mean, that can maybe make you, it definitely makes me feel better if I see an expense in that column because I'm like, all right, at least it's an investment in my business. And I think it helps me visually see that for sure. Um, now, Dan, so do you pay, do you have to charge sale tax in the city, but then not outside of the city? Or is it just... Uh, tax no state tax so uh depends on the service like you know something like a flat fee we're just we're not like adding on top of it we're just you know we're saying this is what the invoice was for the invoice was for a thousand dollars or something like that yeah. okay like so this is what the percentage is and um you know because we're doing payroll quarterly um you know we're calculating that quarterly uh if we were doing it monthly or bi-weekly like we do that but um you know so uh, yeah, we just have to do it, but we have a rhythm with our, um, our CPA and, um, you know, we know how it works, but I remember being like really shocked because it was a couple of years ago when the city of Denver started really going after photographers specifically, um, cause that's where a bulk of, uh, you know, our freelance income comes from. Um, and it was, they were, they were looking for, um, you know, exactly that, like, you know, no UO sales tax on this stuff. So yeah, it's again, um, you know, not something I would have just stumbled upon, uh, reading a uh, tax literature in my uh, copious amounts of free time. So uh, yeah, it's helpful to have a professional look at it. Indeed. Um, so those are kind of the main things that you have to have as your basic framework for your business. It's also really nice to have a website. You want to have some place that people can go to see your portfolio of work, to see how you might fit into their professional plans, their organization, um, whatever. And just as kind of verification that you exist. Like if I, look up a name and I see no Google results, no LinkedIn, all of a sudden I'm like, how does this person not exist? So you want to be in this space as a content creator, at least content, create content for yourself. That said, I mean, maybe this is just a simple one page about dot me page or something like that to start. Um, you just want to have some kind of a presence there if you can build to that. Um, business cards are great. Like when I first got business cards printed, I was like, am I nuts? Why am I printing business cards? Who uses business cards anymore? Turns out a ton of people do. If ever we go to conferences again, hand those things out like candy. I mean, I have handed them out. I've actually had a few friends who've just taken handfuls and handed them out. And every once in a while, you'll get a call or an email from someone who's like, hey, I came across your information. Or we met at a conference three years ago. Um, I actually was putting on a live event here in New York uh, a couple months ago. And someone came up to me and they're like, wow, I've got your card on my desk because we talked three jobs ago and I wanted to work with you in this. And now I'm doing this and I think I'm going to have a project for you. Um, so that can really come in handy. It's definitely far more worth, um, worth it than I thought. I just use Moo. I keep it simple and it works. Um, again, nice to have. These are the things that you splurge on, right? The accountant and the attorney, because they are going to save you a lot of money in the long run when they, you know, give you your fees and you see that you might have to pay them a few hundred bucks. It's not always going to feel great, but you will find a way to recoup that money. All right. So once you've kind of got a basic idea of what your freelance world is going to look like, 
you've got to think about um, some of the harder things, your rates. I think figuring out and my rate has been the hardest thing that I've done and the hardest thing that anyone else I know who freelances has done. There are these all these different rule of thumbs like twice your old hourly rate at your last salary job or three times or whatever, which kind of works, kind of doesn't. I mean, I've used it before and it's worked before, but um, I think the best bit of advice that I've ever give, been given was to have a range. One woman uh, put it like this. She's like, well, I'm working for this rich, horrible company. You're damn right. I'm going to charge them, you know, three times my past hourly salary rate. But then I'm also working for this tiny nonprofit that does local news in a community that I love. And I know they've only got like 50 bucks an hour for me. So that's what I'm going to charge for them. Um, so having that scale, knowing what projects you might cut a break to or not can really be helpful. Other thing you want to think about is like, what's the minimum hourly rate you need to survive? And this is where having a real good handle on your expenses comes in. I know exactly how much money I spend on everything every month. Yes, I have a spreadsheet for that too. Um, so I know, I also have health insurance in that. I'm accounting for taxes. So I know like, what's my goal hourly? What's the minimum that I need to be making to keep this going? Maybe if I've got a lot of free time, I have a hole in my calendar for a week, maybe I'll go a little bit lower than that. Maybe I'm working with a giant, highly profitable financial institution. Maybe I'll go a lot higher than I might normally go. So really think of it as a range, um, more so than anything else. Um, do we have any questions on that? Susanna just says uh, that uh, her rate is based on a writer's market averages for work you do, which is $65 to $85 an hour. Uh, and you're in the process of launching your website and debating on whether uh, to post those rates. Do you have an opinion on when to disclose rates um, publicly um, is what I assume you're asking, Susanna. Um, uh, it doesn't seem like a common practice um, on, but on a website, but what, uh, what Susanna said is she really likes the transparency. Um, I feel like this is different for different um, jobs. Uh, so go ahead. Yeah, I mean, so I do a lot of different types of work. So I don't put that rate out there. Um, I think you can, but sometimes by putting it out there, you might have clients who would otherwise have come to try and work with you who don't come and try and work with you. Or you might have clients that end up lowballing you. Um, you know, it's like whenever... Uh, you say, hey, this is my salary requirement. Someone says, great, here you go. And you're like, crap, I should have asked for more money. That's the thing to keep in mind is you could be leaving money on the table because, I mean, there's an entire, I think for, you know, digital audience, social media strategy consulting, I and even, you know, certain engineering tasks, I've heard of freelance hourly rates that go from like 75 to 200 an hour. Um, so there's definitely a big range and you don't want to shortchange yourself. Yeah, I'll just say from a photography perspective, I think most of the folks on here are probably writers, but uh, any of you who are interested in on the photography side, um, you know, I, I tend to be much more, and we tend to be much more transparent with our rates on the hourly rate. Um, mm -hmm. Now, what we're building into that, of course, is not just the act of taking the pictures, but the work that comes after that, um, the right. editing of those pictures, the packaging of them, um, whatever else, putting them in a gallery, all those other things. So you do need to think about when you talk about your rates, like what's the total work being done here? Writing a little bit different. Um, I, I will say that I haven't necessarily seen um, uh, rates. Um, and I would say like a writing or a, a rate uh, for, for me when I do it is very different from a consulting rate, um, uh, which uh, I think is that I sort of have in my head of what an hourly rate might look like. So it just sort of depends on what the job is. Right. And almost all of my writing projects are flat rate projects. So I know I'm going to get X fee for X story if that story only takes me a couple hours to write and I end up making 100, 150 bucks an hour from that. Great. It's rare that it happens. I mean, it's rare that you just have that command of that subject area. More often than not, it's like I really want to write this story. By the time you get done with the editing process, you don't even want to think about the hours that have gone into it. But I would say most of your writing work is going to be flat rate. You just need to think about how much time am I going to need to put into this story and how can I make sure that I'm doing it as efficiently as possible. I'm an over reporter, so I've had to scale back on that big time to make some of these projects really cost effective. I, I'm sure it depends, but I mean, I'm curious, um, you know, it, it used to be like people would charge like a dollar a word or you'd hear like these crazy rates from like the New York Times Magazine, you know, like $4 a word or something like that. Um, 
Uh, I don't actually know what they pay now, but uh, do you do you charge by the word now? Um, or do you ever have that opportunity? Or is it really just it's the flat fee and you know, and we kind of generally agree on a range of like, this is going to be 800 to 1000 words. And so it works out to this. I mean, generally, it ends up being 50 cents to a dollar a word. Um, but some of it's like I have one client's like, okay, I need these types of articles, it'll be 500 words, you get paid 500 bucks. Great. Um, but then it just, it, it really depends, but I'll usually based on my time, it will end up averaging 50 cents to a dollar a word. Great. Thanks. Yep. Um, there are still some places that pay, you know, a couple bucks a word, but they are very few and far between. Um, okay, so a few of the things you want to do is make yourself available. I think as journalists, we often, like, if I'm trying to email other journalists, sometimes I have to work really hard to find their email addresses, which seems nuts for a business where people getting in touch with you and telling you things is your bread and butter. So make it easier for your sources, your editors, your future clients to find and email you. That's why I'm on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook. I know that these are the places that people who are looking for social media strategy who might be in my inner or my, like the exterior of my orbit, they're gonna be in all those places. I've got my email address out there. I make it pretty easy to find me. If you can't Google me and find me, you are doing something wrong. Um, I'm at a bit of a benefit because I have such an unusual name that you know you're gonna get me. Um, but really people should be able to find you. Be proactive. Now, this is one of the best things that I've learned. Um, with some of the work that I've gotten, these have been organizations that weren't really necessarily looking for strategic help. Um, but I was able to say, hey, look, you need me, let me work with you. Um, I'm actually working with one brand client right now. It's called the Economic Club of New York. A friend of mine is managing that account. Um, and she was like, I need someone to do social media. And I had been watching it for a while. And I was like, yes, you do. You need me to do this for you. And I had actually started talking to her about it a few weeks before she actually got that account, because when she got it, I knew she didn't know anything about economics and like all of that stuff. She knew I did. So I was able to make myself available for that. There are other people that I've gone out, out to and said, hey, I do this. Do you need help with this? Or people have said, I'm trying to figure out what to do. And I tell them, I can help you to do that. So think about like, what are the projects you'd want to do? Is there an outlet or a publisher out there where there's something obviously missing that you can help them with? Those are opportunities where you might be able to just create work for yourself and you're not having to compete with all these other people for that one assignment. Um, using your reporting skills to find those unadvertised opportunities is gold. You want to find the things that they don't have the job posts on every board. And this is where talking to your network, keeping in touch with your network, really researching what's out there, where opportunities might be. Um, even things like looking at RFPs could be helpful here, depending on the type of work that you're doing. Um, but talking to people, you might find, hey, I don't have any work for you right now, but this person is desperate for an editor you might be able to call them up as well. So just be really proactive and use those reporting skills. Um, the other thing is to be intentional. I have loved travel my entire career. I have been writing travel stories on the side for my day job for years. Um, and I think that, you know, being intentional about that is what allowed me to get these plum travel assignments. Being intentional when I worked for digital outlets to freelance is what allowed me to pivot and transition my career. If there's something different that you want to do, freelance is a great way for you to make that pivot. Because when I first started writing travel stories, nobody was going to hire me and say, hi, here's some money, go to this far from place and write this really cool story about this luxury safari. Nope. But what I had done is I had been pitching these editors and said, I went on this personal trip. Here's a story turned in clean copy. Um, so I was intentionally building that relationship and that portfolio to get the better assignments. And that's really what allowed me to make that particular pivot. You, you said uh, something right there, Mina, turn in clean copy. Um, do you have other people uh, edit your work before you turn it in? Does it depend? Um, I mean, I just... Uh, I feel like that's kind of one of those things about making a really great first impression, especially if you're working for a new client for the first time. Um, I probably should do this more than I do, um, but not that often. Oftentimes I'm really working on like tight deadlines and just getting things around. So I don't always have time to do that. 
But that said, there are definitely times where if I've got a pitch or I've got copy or I've got a project plan and I want to get another set of eyes on it, I will find one of my friends going to one of my Slack groups, see who's got a green dot. And there's usually always at least another set of eyes you can have on them. Yeah, I would echo that. I certainly lean on friends. Um, you know, if you have a significant other um, yeah, who has a good significant editing eye. Other. Yeah. My significant yeah. other ends up reading all my stuff and proofreading all my stuff. Like, that's ultimately the best way to have an editor. If you've got a kid or a parent, that could also work. So you got a yeah. lot of options. Uh, we have a question here, uh, just, um, you know, sort of in the, we have some folks who are interested in travel. Uh, what do you think the future of travel magazines and websites are? You know, it's, that's a, I right. Um, you know, that speaking of like a particular section yeah. of the, um, you know, journalism world, not just coronavirus, even before all that, um, really changing a lot. Um, what do you sort of see that looking like? I mean, I think it's going to be really, really hard. The longer we stay shut down, the longer travel is hampered, the longer that these businesses aren't able to fill their hotel rooms and flights, the harder it's going to be um, for travel publishers. I know quite a few publications that have stopped accepting freelance pitches or just completely shut down. Um, I think it's going to be a while. <laughs> Um, before any of us are going anywhere. That said, I have so many friends who are like, you know, we're never going to travel again. It's over. Could you imagine ever wanting to get on a flight again? I'm like, do I want to get on a flight right now? I can't even tell you how much I just want to get out of here. And like, I miss airports even. So I think there's going to be something, but who knows what it's going to look like. Um, and I think that's kind of the interesting opportunity here, right? Like travel magazines, airline magazines have been here and they've been what they were, um, but they haven't really changed and disrupted. Maybe there's a different way to do travel content now. Maybe there's an app, maybe there's guidebooks, who knows what it is. There's gonna be, I mean, as long as humans are alive and breathing, I believe they're gonna have a sense of adventure and wanna travel and they're gonna need information for that travel. Um, so there's going to be something out there, but I think that those opportunities to write for these publications are going to be much harder to come by. If you're not on staff, the rates are going to be a little bit lower. Um, but on the flip side, if you're in a place where there's not a lot of other people doing that, you can become the expert on that place. Um, but I think it's going to be hard. I'm not planning to get any of my revenue for travel writing for the next like six months. If I do great, but right now I'm pretty much considering that's off. Um, and a lot of my full-time travel writer friends, I know I have one friend who's um, been freelancing just as a travel writer for 12 years, blows my mind how she's been able to do it. She says she's now writing for a logistics company because everyone's supply chain is a hot mess. People want to know what to do, how to fix their logistics operations. She knows that there's not going to be any travel happening, so she doesn't have any trips to be writing about. So she's pivoted temporarily. So I think that that might be kind of things to think about there. You had another question about, uh, you mentioned Slack a few times. For those of you who uh, aren't familiar with it, um, you know, a lot of big corporations use it. It's sort of real-time chat. Um, like me and I, I'm in a bunch of Slack groups as well. Are there any ones specifically for freelancers that you know of, or is it just a bunch of journalism groups that you've sort of just found through your connections? Um, yeah, I don't think there are any ones for freelancers that I know of, but a lot of them are like journalism groups. So there's a journalist of color Slack, which is all journalists of color. There's a freelance channel in there where people are often posting when they're looking for freelance help or if they're freelancer looking for work. Um, I'm also, a, one that's been surprisingly good has been my Northwestern University alumni Slack channel because there's an all hiring channel in there where there are all kinds of interesting um, people who need writers for all kinds of interesting projects. Like I actually did um, a big project for the National Apartment Association where I looked into class B and class C multifamily real estate investing. Didn't know a lot about it going in, but it was the most fascinating article that I've read. Uh, you know, that I've written in a while because I got to learn about something new. And that's an opportunity I never would have learned about had I not seen a little note in a Slack group. How much um, in your pitches to editors, you know, do you like rely on, you know, either the past places you've worked or like past work, do you like link to when you're kind of making that cold pitch, do you link to other uh, articles that you've done uh, to, as sort of collateral to say, look, I'm not just somebody who's just coming at this for the first time. Um, how do you structure that? If it's a new person, I might link to a clip or two, like don't overdo it. Remember, they have very limited attention span. 
Um, I might mention a couple names. Really what I do is I try and say, is this relevant uh, to this particular thing? So for, you know, if I'm making a pitch to um, say Barron's, I'm gonna focus on, I had bylines in the Wall Street Journal. I worked for a wire service. I covered these things. I might not even mention, hey, I did all this writing for travel and leisure and I wrote a whole guide to Cuba for trip savvy. But if I'm, you know, pitching a travel publication, I might bring those up. So it's really just gonna be tailoring it and maybe giving one or two examples. Great, thanks. We can keep going. All right. Okay, so this is generally how my freelance world breaks down. Um, I've got about 15 clients in my universe at any given time. Now, this does not necessarily mean that I am actively working for 15 people right now because I might lose my mind. I've got maybe five, six clients that I work with on a regular basis. So every month I'm doing a consistent amount of work for them. I've got a couple where it's like, I do X for you every month and you give me X amount of money, monthly recurring revenue. That's really the key to being able to freelance is can you find that one core client or two core clients where you know you're gonna get a set amount of money every month and you can be able to pay your bills with that and you're not constantly having to replace that income stream. So if you can get one or two of those clients, you're generally in a pretty good place. Um, and then I have OTR, one-time revenue. Oftentimes these will be one-off articles and things like that that I write. Um, so I've got you know five, six people that I'm working with regularly. Maybe I'm doing strategy consulting with them. Um, maybe I've got an ongoing relationship to do teaching or training. I do LinkedIn and Reddit seminars for the Center for Cooperative Media. I know they're gonna pay me X amount of money every month. I'm gonna do X amount of work for them. That's great, but then these stories that I write for maybe USA Today or Chicago Booth Review, goes on top of that. And those clients are more like my one-off clients. So the people who are in my universe, I might send you pitches. I might, you know, look out for emails. If you've got assignments, I might try and find ways to work with you, but I'm not working with you on that regular basis. Um, but things change. I had one client who's like, hey, I have to come back. I have no budget at all. Um, and that was three weeks ago. Now they're like, I got a paycheck protection loan. And now I have a budget to be able to do this. Let's come back and work together again. Or, you know, I want to work with you, but I don't have time now. Or I don't have budget now. Um, you know, those conversations can be long. There's one site that I just finished working with on a social audit and strategy recommendation um, where we probably talked for a couple months. They were kind of in my orbit, but it took a while for that to actually become a project that put money in my pocket. And I think that most freelancers who are successful will tell you they've got something like this. They've got a handful of clients they're working with regularly, a handful of clients that they work with occasionally, but they know they're going to work with a certain amount, and then the clients that they're pursuing. And they're having a conversation with all of them regularly and swapping them in and out as needs and availability changes. All right. And so this is kind of, I've got varied interests, as you can tell. So the way I look at my freelance world now is in buckets. I have buckets of work that I do. I've got my writing bucket and I have a color code for that on my spreadsheet. This is my travel writing, my business um, journalism, all the content that I'm writing. I've got audience development. This is coming up with a social plan, coming up with a social strategy, um, securing account handles, figuring out um, email strategy, cleaning up email lists, all those kinds of things. Um, I've also got journalism training, the work that I mentioned to you that I'm doing with the Center for Cooperative Media and a few other projects like that. And then I've got my brand work. For me, really, this is working with the Economic Club of New York to live tweet their events, but I'm open to other potential things um, if they work out and they sound right. So when I'm seeking work, I'm really looking in these places and I know that these are my specialties. And I also know that I've got a bit of diversification because I want to have my hands in multiple things so that if, you know, one thing turns off, there's always going to be something else to lean back on. Just worked for both myself and that friend of mine who switched to writing for a logistics company. Okay. A um, few things to keep in mind. As a freelancer, you are not alone. There are lots of other freelancers out there, and it's generally a pretty helpful group. We've all been in the same struggle of rejection and trying to figure out how to get a response to our pitches, collecting money. Um, it's a good group. Um, one of the best resources I found is Study Hall XYZ. It is a 
um, Patron service. I pay like four bucks a month. I get a weekly roundup of editors looking for freelance pitches. I also get a listserv where people are talking about editors that are great to work for, horrible to work for, publications who don't pay on time, um, stories that need homes, pitches that are like ripe for the taking, all kinds of stuff. It's a good discussion and it's really good return on investment. So far for my 48 bucks a year this year, I've earned $600 in from content uh, from stories that I've pitched from seeing calls for pictures and study hall XYZ. Um, Anna Codreo uh, Redo also has a newsletter. She curates a lot of freelance opportunities, editors looking for pitches, skews heavily European. She's also got a lot of advice for building out a freelance business, figuring out what you want to do, um, figuring out your rates and things like that. I found it very helpful as I've been getting going in my own work. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, but Sean Mirez Williams also has a newsletter that's really great. She's got some call for pitches. She's also got various writing grant opportunities that she curates in her list as well, though it does skew to the UK. Um, this last one, it's really simple, but believe it or not, it actually works. Just do a good Twitter search for looking for pitches, call for pitches, things like that. You will find those desperate editors because for as many editors as there are who don't have the time to get back to freelancers, there are desperate editors who just need copy written, turned in, clean, and easy. They don't want to rewrite it. They just want your story and they can put it online and get on with their day. Um, and the more desperate they get, the more open they're going to get with their calls for pitches. And if they're putting it on Twitter, that says, I have an immediate need. Please come and help me. So it's a great call for you guys. I have seen that last, to that last point, I have seen the looking for pitches, call for pitches uh, a ton in the last few weeks, um, you know, especially as a lot of journalists, again, go on furlough or unfortunately many get laid off. Um, you know, they, they, I'm telling you, they are out there. I, mm -hmm. I'm, you, you might think like, oh my gosh, the whole world's collapsing around me. Like, I see stuff from editors that are retweeted all the time that are like, I've got this massive editorial budget, send me pitches. Mm -hmm. um, it exists. Yeah. I mean, people like, if you look at it, all these newsrooms that are furloughing and cutting back, it's not like there's less news to cover. There's not less content and fewer stories out there. There's still lots of work that needs to be done. Um, and you're one way to get at least some of that work done. Any, uh, I don't know if you, I don't know if you have a, uh, like a Twitter list of editors that you maybe keep meaning or something like that, or do you just kind of have this curated feed of, of stuff, any, anything particular that, um, beyond just the searching? Um, I have another spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> I have, um, so it's just a spreadsheet I use to track my contacts for my different beats that I now cover. I've got a tab on there that's for editors and I put notes about the people that I've pitched, the people that I've worked with, people that I might want to work with there. Um, but I think that, you know, maintaining a list of editors, is one thing you don't want to put too much work into because they change all the time. But if you can find a few editors that you really like working with and follow them as they move through brands, that's a really good way to go. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, we're, we're kind of at time now and we've had a, a good discussion. Uh, any final questions from folks? Feel free to just... Um, Drop them in the uh, chat. Let me just go back and look um, and see if we have anything else that maybe I, um, oh, uh, this is one I forgot to, to circle back on. How do you set social media rates by the hour, by the project? Does it depend? So it really depends. I know how much I need to make per hour to make this really work for me so that I can pay my bills, make it worth my time. Sometimes it, um, with some clients, it, it, it can be easy to say, hey, this is my hourly rate. With a lot of them, it's easier to do a project rate. Um, so like I have one client where it's like, okay, look, you want me to do all these things? How about, you know, I, you know, I gave them an hourly rate and they're like, that's way too high. Can we come in at this rate that's half of that? Um, because it was somebody I knew, it was much easier to have that discussion very quick and straightforward. We did it, said, okay, what, I'll give you, you know, about this many hours a week to do what you need done for this flat monthly rate. Great. Um, well, I think those are all the questions that I see from everyone, and I want to be respectful of everybody's time. This is a really great discussion and presentation. Me, thank. I think you're at the end, yes? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Great. Any any last uh, any last uh, things to to share with the group meeting before we sign off? Um, you know, I think for me, I've been thinking a lot about freelancing. At first, as a freelancer, I was a freelancer while looking for a full time job. Right. 
And that was very hard for me to get out of because I saw that full-time job as security. Um, and then at one point I had actually, uh, you know, I'd seen all of these people I know get these great jobs or some horrible jobs and they weren't lasting as long as, you know, some of my freelance clients had. And I think at that point I was like, you know what, I'm just going to stop looking for jobs and really put my energy into freelancing. And that's when things changed for me. Um, now that I'm here a couple months into the pandemic, I think it's really a more secure place to be. I can add new clients if I need to make more money. I can um, deal with the ebb and flow of clients that are coming in. I can pursue dream projects. It's really, I feel like I've got a lot more freedom than my friends who are chained to one employer who could cut their job at any moment. Um, I, like I said, I've got about 15 employers and if I'm going to see trouble on the horizon with one, I might try and replace it with another. And there is an endless um, possibility of companies and outlets that I can be working with in the future. So really, I feel, I think, a bit more secure knowing that I've got lots of places that my income is coming from and I'm not beholden to that one place that I'm praying won't shut down or lay me off. We have uh, one more question here. Um, have you found people who insisted on their freelancers being in New York or Los Angeles or maybe more open to remote work now? Um, and is it just, you know, all coronavirus coverage all the time? Is that all people are looking for now? No. So, I mean, I think as a freelancer, really, you haven't had to be in New York or DC. I mean, like you can really be anywhere you want. I mean, I've only got one of my clients, which now kind of would need me to be in New York right now, but everybody's remote. I think especially with coronavirus, being remote is fine. But as you're a freelancer, like editors don't care where you are. They just care what you can give them. And where you are might give you a unique ability to give them content they can't get anywhere else. If I'm looking for an expert on skiing to give me fresh skiing content every week, where am I going to look? Probably Colorado and Utah. So your location could actually be an advantage. Um, in terms of COVID-19, a lot of I think the first month or two was really hardcore COVID content, but people are going deeper and they're looking at other content now. And I think publishers realize we've had this huge influx of new users come in through our COVID content. What are we going to give them to keep them here? And that opens up the pool for freelance pitches of a lot of different kinds. And you guys are sitting at home. You're probably reading a lot more than you used to and a lot of different topics. And that should show you that there's a lot of opportunity out there. Yeah, I would just echo that just some of the stuff we're seeing in our publications across the country, uh, just the, I don't know if the word is fatigue, it's probably fatigue, but just as people have sort of gotten used to this, the new normals come in, like um, coronavirus content is still the stuff that people are definitely reading a lot of, but it's not everything. And, um, you know, we seem to be coming back down to earth, um, mm -hmm. so to speak. And so, yeah, I, I think that variety is certainly what a lot of people are looking for. Definitely. And if you've got something that's got a COVID angle and something else, that could work out really well, too. So there's there's definitely opportunities out there to write both COVID and non-COVID content. Great. Mina, well, um, thank you so much for your time. This was really wonderful. Uh, lots of, uh, I'm seeing applause on the camera. Thank Aww, you. Uh, yeah. Um, a, a reminder that uh, we will be posting this um, on the Denver Press Club YouTube channel. Uh, I wish we were fancy enough to have a, uh, a special URL, but um, we don't have quite the subscription levels uh, that uh, some of the YouTube rock stars do. So just do a search for Denver Press Club. I, we should have that posted, uh, if not tonight, then uh, by tomorrow. So um, great. Thank you so much for the time, um, Mina. And um, again, um, uh, good luck to all of you. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me um, and uh, we can get those um, in the right place. So thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everybody.